afternoon. I want to talk about HIV and AIDS today. This is the one virus and the one viral disease that gets a lecture of its own. I don't do that in this course. I don't teach you by virus because I don't think that's the best way to learn virology. I think principles, the way we've done it, is best for an introductory course. It's harder to teach. And that's why most colleges have courses that go virus by virus, because they can look in a textbook and learn the virus and teach it. I don't want to do that. I don't want to take the easy way out. And of course, I had the advantage of, of writing a textbook, which gave me the background to do this. But we do have to talk about AIDS on its own, because it's a really important virus and disease, of course. And we're following on the emerging virus infection, because this is really the big emerging infection of recent years that illustrates a lot of the principles that we have talked about. I highly recommend this book if you're interested in some ideas about how uh, AIDS began, the origins of AIDS by Jacques Pepin. He's a physician who actually worked for many years in Africa and got ideas for what he think happened, uh, which I will refer to a few times today. And he writes this tragedy the uh, AIDS epidemic, pandemic, of course, was facilitated or even caused by human interventions, colonization, urbanization, and probably well-intentioned public health campaigns. I'll, I'll touch on a few of them, but uh, I highly recommend it. It's pretty easy and a pretty quick, quick read. So our story begins today with a publication in the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which I've read religiously for ages, as far as I can remember, to find out what's going on uh, in infectious diseases, as well as ProMed Mail. That's another great one. This was from June 5th, 1981, a report uh, from Los Angeles of pneumocystis pneumonia. And, and this was in the period October 1980 to May 81. Five young men, all active homosexuals, were treated for biopsy-confirmed pneumocystis carini pneumonia at three different hospitals in LA. Two of the patients died. Uh, all five had laboratory confirmed previous or current CMV infection and candidal mucosal infections. And so they had the, the case reports of those five there. And basically what happened here was some physicians noticed a pattern emerging where, um, first of all, this kind of infection is almost exclusively limited to severely immunosuppressed patients. It was really rare to see this in healthy young men. Uh, and so they looked at all the data and they, in the end, said they, this, these observations suggest the possibility of a cellular immune dysfunction related to a common exposure that predisposes individuals to opportunistic infection. So they were very smart in thinking about something was going on in these individuals that was making them susceptible to infections that they normally wouldn't get. All right, so this is 1980-81, the first report. A lot of people in other cities throughout the US, especially New York, had seen similar patterns. So this really brought it all to their attention. And immediately, um, other cities began to look for similar uh, syndromes. And in fact, pneumocystis pneumonia, the one that was in that report, and Kaposi's sarcoma, together also in, were also observed in other urban centers. And the key here was clusters, so suggesting that something had precipitated that. But very quickly, the Centers for Disease Control established the case definition. The earliest case definition for this disease was very simple. Kaposi's sarcoma or opportunistic infections. These are so rare in healthy people that just seeing them was an indicator that something was going on. In 1982, the disease was called AIDS, but before that, it was called GRID gay-related immunodeficiency because uh, people thought it was uh, transmitted uh, exclusively among homosexuals, which of course turned out not to be the case, and later uh, very quickly was found transmitted to babies at birth through the blood that is generated at the birth process, also heterosexually and uh, through blood products. The virus was just isolated in 1983, two years later, very rapid process, uh, progress from the lymph node of a patient with lymphadenopathy, which you may remember, swollen lymph nodes in Paris. Uh, this brought the Nobel Prize in 2008 to Montagnier and Barre Sinoussi, who both uh, worked on the virus to isolate it. Of course, as soon as you have the virus, you can then de develop a test. So an antigen test was developed a year later and electron microscopy and sequencing of the virus revealed it to be a retrovirus, and in particular, 
part of the lentiviruses, which were known, already known retroviruses uh, of other animals. And so uh, here's our schematic for HIV. It's slightly different from the schematic for retrovirus that we've used uh, so far in the conical nature of the nucleocapsid. And here's the electron micrograph showing the same structural information. So here's the retroviridae family. We've talked about a few uh, members of this family so far. It, it's rather complicated and it's divided into subfamilies, as you can see here. Uh, and this subfamily has the viruses that we've been talking about. Uh, the alpha retrovirus includes the avian leukosis virus that we talked about when we talked about transformation and oncogenesis. Another human retrovirus, human T cell lymphotropic virus is a delta retrovirus. The walleye dermal sarcoma virus of fish that I mentioned briefly is an epsilon retrovirus. And then uh, HIV 1 and 2, there are two different types, is a lentivirus. So what is a lentivirus? A, a lentivirus is a group of viruses already known, uh, including equine infectious anemia virus causing a fatal disease of horses had already been isolated in the early 1900s and there were uh, other immunodeficiency viruses of other animals as well that were lentiviruses long before HIV had been discovered. So lentiviruses were not, not new but this was of course the first human lentivirus. Um, so these are immunodeficiency viruses HIV 1 and 2 and then of course the lymphotropic viruses are a separate uh, kind of retrovirus that are also human retroviruses cause different diseases. When HIV was first identified, in fact, some people thought it was another HTLV, but it became quickly clear that it wasn't. So it, this is a typical retrovirus. The particle is an enveloped virus with glycoproteins in the envelope. It contains a nucleocapsid with two, two molecules of RNA, plus stranded RNA, covered with protein as a nucleocapsid. It also includes the integrase and reverse transcriptase and protease in the particle. Uh, below this is a map of the proviral DNA. So remember that is the DNA that's integrated into the host cell. And you can see it has two LTRs, one at either end, with, which contain, of course, promoters and terminators for RNA synthesis. And below is a map of all the viral proteins encoded in this genome. Now, if you remember the other retroviruses that we've talked about, they all encode gag, pol, and envelope proteins. The gag encodes structural proteins. Uh, the capsid protein, the Paul, of course, the reverse transcriptase, uh, RNase H and integrase, and the envelope, of course, encodes the envelope proteins. But you can see now the, the HIV, the lentiviruses, encode lots of other smaller proteins with very interesting names, TAT, REV, VIF, VPR, VPU, TAT, REV, and NEF. And these uh, are unique to the lentiviruses. That's why we call these viruses with complex genomes because they, they encode more proteins than, say, avian uh, leukosis virus, which has gag, pol, and envelope. And some of these we have talked about in terms of their function. For example, we talked about how REV helps get unspliced uh, mRNAs out of the nucleus, and other of these are immune antagonists. One of them antagonizes tetherin, uh, which is an innate, uh, it, which is a protein that blocks infection. So uh, AIDS, of course, stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. A syndrome is the occurrence together of a group uh, or pattern of symptoms. So in initially, you know, all these different characteristic symptoms uh, were associated with infection, so they were called a syndrome, and the name has since stuck. HIV causes AIDS. Now, you, I, I can't believe I have to say that, not to you, certainly, but many people in the world do not believe this. Of course, they're in the same group as the anti-vaxxers who don't believe that vaccines are good for you. And these are called AIDS denialists. And I hear from them on a regular basis that there's no proof that HIV causes AIDS, which is, of course, nonsense. Complete, 100% nonsense. You tell the 78 million people out there who have been infected with HIV that it doesn't cause the disease. The hypothesis has been tested by inadvertent infection of people with HIV contaminated blood. So very early on, before we started testing blood for HIV-1, we gave it to people and they got infected. 
uh, people with hemophilia who get very concentrated preparations of red blood cells were particularly at risk. They got massively infected. It was quite clear that they got the virus from these preparations. So, in addition to every other bit of evidence, including, for example, if you treat people with antiretrovirals, they get better that's, that are specific for HIV. There's plenty of evidence that uh, HIV causes AIDS. Let me give you a few numbers just to impress upon you the extent of this uh, pandemic. Here are some numbers in the U.S. So here, HIV has killed over 600,000 people since the 80s, and that's more than all combat-related deaths uh, in the 20th century and wars that we have fought. Right now, over 1.2 million people in the U.S. are living with HIV. 13% don't know it. They haven't been diagnosed. In 2015, there are 18,000 new infections, 70% in men, 30% in women, and half of all new infections occur in people 25 years of age uh, or younger. The CDC has published this chart at the bottom here which uh, divides the infections in 2015, uh, these 18,000 new infections into the different groups. And you can see uh, those groups that are most infected are men who have sex with men, MSM, black, white, Hispanic, Latino, followed by black heterosexual women, uh, and then a number of other groups as well. So uh, this continues to be transmitted despite us understanding how transmission occurs and, and good ways to prevent it. Uh, in 2015, which are the, the numbers lag behind from year to year, we don't have last year's numbers yet, so 2015 is the most recent year. Uh, there are thir almost 37 million people living uh, with HIV. This is a global numbers now, uh, 35 million adults almost 18 million women. And here's the real tragedy, children less than 15 years of age, 1.8 million, many infected at birth and they have no say in the fact that they're going to be infected, of course, and they, they go on to be infected at birth and live with the disease and will die if they're not treated, of course, as, as would everyone else be. Uh, and new, new infections in 2015, 2.1 million, 150,000 children, and deaths in 2015, 1.1 million, 110,000 children. Uh, these are global numbers in different regions of the world so you know which areas have the most infections. And here, this first series of two columns, people living with HIV of all ages, we're comparing 2010 to 2015. Um, and you could, of course, the number goes up because pe these are people living uh, with the infection. The global total uh, has gone from 33 to 30 seven million in the past five years. Um, you can see that Eastern and Southern Africa has a huge uh, fraction of the infected individuals, 19 million, and also uh, Western and Central Africa, six and a half million. Uh, but Western, Central Europe, North America also has quite a few, Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, on the right are the new infections of all ages, and here, for the most part, the numbers are going down. Uh, for example, global 2.2 million to 2.1 million. And that's the result of educating people on how transmission occurs and how they can prevent transmission. But in many parts of the world, transmission still occurs because uh, people don't, don't take steps to uh, modify their behavior. The most important numbers, of course, are how many people we're treating with antiretroviral therapy. And initially, when these drugs were developed, uh, th they were found to work well, especially triple combination therapy, which we'll talk about today, we talked about last time, um, was very effective, but not everyone was getting it who needed it. But philanthropists and WHO uh, stepped in and started to make sure that more individuals were treated. So you can see over the last, um, this is from 2010 to 2015. In all of these regions, uh, the numbers have been going up. We're not quite at the numbers, at the levels we need to be yet, and I think I have a slide later on that shows that. This is a very interesting slide, which is the relationship between AIDS-related death and HIV treatment coverage. So the, the line uh, is AIDS-related deaths of all ages, and you can see they peaked in about uh, the mid-2000s or so, and then they've slowly been going down, coincident with 
the increased coverage of uh, individuals with antiretrovirals. You can see going up to between 40 and 50 percent. And uh, so that's clearly, you can clearly save lives by treating people with antiretrovirals. So the more we treat, the better. Uh, new HIV infections, 15 years and older by region, uh, from 2010 to 2015. The colored lines represent different areas, as you can see here on the left. Um, the, num the, the numbers of infections have remained constant, but they're not going down, right? They're, they're remaining constant. They need to go down, of course. We're not doing a good job of doing that. On the right here, uh, again, these countries mostly staying constant, a little bit going up here, but this one, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, is still increasing uh, much more than it should be. So there's a lot more work to be done, obviously. Now, in, in 2015, there were about 5,700 new infections a day, so 240 per hour. So as we talk today, 240 more people will get infected. You can see many of them in sub-Saharan Africa, many in children, and then the breakdown in adults between uh, women and young people. So it's still more than, than we need to uh, have taking place. Triple drug therapy has slowed the pandemic, as, as I showed you. Uh, but this requires money, and it's only been in the last five years or ten years or so that people have been donating enough money in order to treat countries that can't pay for these very expensive drugs. So here's another uh, uh, graph showing you numbers of people receiving antiretroviral therapy globally and by WHO region. And so you can see people receiving ART here on the top graph in millions. Uh, you can see the African region, which requires it the most, is getting the, the largest amount, of course, and that's increased substantially. Uh, but the percentage is the important number, and that's shown on the bottom graph. This is the percentage of people who need it, who are getting the drugs, and you see we're only up to about 40% uh, or so, so less than half in these areas. So we have a lot of work to do to get drugs uh, to people who need them. So the drugs work, but we have to be able to deliver them. This is a common theme in public health. You can have great vaccines and great drugs, but if you can't get them to people, they're not going to do any good. However, we don't have a cure yet for HIV, AIDS. You can't get rid of the virus from an infected individual. You can treat them with antiretrovirals and prevent them from getting ill, but the virus will always be there. There's no vaccine, so we can't block infections. People are working very hard on this. I'll show you some examples later of what's being done. So you have to take antiviral drugs the rest of your life. As soon as you stop, the virus will begin replicating again because there are latent reservoirs of infected hematopoietic progenitor cells which live, probably last your entire life. So the virus, of course, can integrate its genome into infected cells. It can integrate into CD4 cells, lymphocytes. It will eventually kill those cells, but there are another population of cells that live for a long time in which the viral genome is silent. The virus infects them, the genome integrates, and no virus particles are produced. So these cells live forever, essentially. And we don't know how to get rid of them, and that's why if you stop taking antiretrovirals, those uh, cells will begin to produce virus again. Even if they produce a few particles, they will then go out and, fe and infect uh, other susceptible cells uh, in the body. Uh, if you stop taking drugs, you'll get drug-resistant viruses. The drugs are expensive. And as you could see from the numbers, it's spreading uh, extensively in sub-Saharan Africa, which shouldn't be the case. So let's talk about the origins uh, of this infection. And it really starts in Africa. The first, after uh, HIV was discovered and shown to be in many places of the world, people then started doing serological surveys all over to try and figure out where it started, right? And the first studies done in Africa, in Zaire and Rwanda, uh, showed that AIDS was common in the capitals of those uh, countries where, and in those countries, 90% of sex workers were infected. Again, these are serological surveys done in various countries throughout the world. This one was pretty uh, damning because so many people in the 80s already were infected. So this is something that clearly did not just begin uh, in 1981. Testing of archive, then people went back to the freezers and said, do we have any old samples of serum from people from 
uh, earlier years. There was clear evidence that the virus was present in the 1960s in the, and 70s in several locations in Central Africa, but not in Western uh, or Eastern Africa. All right, Central Africa is part of the uh, country right here, Congo, DR Congo, Cameroon, Gabon, et cetera. And two samples in particular, quite famous, the oldest clearly positive samples. Again, these are serum samples. This one is from a, a DRC mail from 1959. They happened to be stored. They were just sorting through samples and looking for virus. It was found to be positive uh, in 1998 and a lymph node sample from a female in the same country in 1960 was also found to be positive. So those are the oldest known samples. People have tried to look earlier, but the nucleic acid is degraded and it's very difficult to get anything from them. I'm, not, I'm sure there are some out there that are stored and have uh, HIV genomes in them, but no one's found them yet. But these sequences allow you to establish the molecular clock and to know how much the virus has changed from then until now and to backdate it and to figure out, in part, when the virus was introduced. Now, these two viruses, 60 and 59, 1960 and 1959, they differ by 12%. So uh, that made it very clear that the virus was president. Uh, in, in, at the time, uh, it was called Leopoldville, the capital of DRC of Congo. It's called Kinshasa today. Quite clear that the virus was around then, and because they had already differed so much, 12%. It must have been circulating uh, for a number of years. Because remember, these two viruses, the 59 and 60 isolates, have a common ancestor. And that must have been circulating for quite a while for these two to differ by 12%. So it became clear early on that Central Africa was very important for the origin uh, of HIV-1. So a number of, of virologists began to say what was the source uh, of this virus. And people were looking in a variety of animals. And one of them, this being Central Africa, was the chimpanzee. And uh, a virus called SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, was isolated from a chimp in 1989. It's subsequently been isolated from many other monkeys, as you'll see in a moment. So this is called SIV CPZ. And, and this was very close in sequence to HIV. The idea arose that this um, may be the precursor of HIV. So a number of virologists, including Beatrice Hahn, she's shown here. This is one of the early walls of polio when it used to be in my lab. Uh, she visited and I took her picture in front of it. Now it's in my office, of course, because it, it uh, was blocking the aisle. She headed a big group. She's, she's from Germany, actually. And uh, her daughter took this course a couple of years ago. She didn't tell me until the course was over. She used to sit here every day, and then one day she wrote me a letter, and she said, I'm Beatrice Hahn's daughter. Would you write me a letter of recommendation <laughs> for medical school? OK, it would be nice to talk to you. So I gave this lecture, not even knowing that she's sitting in the class. And then, of course, she was at, at medical school at Columbia, and I saw her again in class when I gave lectures there. Anyway, her mom headed this incredible effort. So when Beatrice gives a seminar about this, she says, I have an army of shit seekers. Because what they go out into the forest in uh, Africa to collect chimpanzee feces and urine, because it, fa it turns out that the virus can be found there. So you don't have to get the chimps and get blood, which is just very difficult. And probably you couldn't do it, because they're, they're in preserves that are protected. But you can go out early in the morning. And when the chimps wake up, the first thing they do is urinate from the trees. And you can stand underneath and collect it. <laughs> And go and tag it. You can see what chimp it is. But then you can do mitochondrial DNA sequencing and know what chimp it's from. And then, of course, look at the HIV and sequence it. So she collected 7,000 uh, chimp fecal samples from 90 different sites throughout Central Africa. So each of these little circles is a chimp site. They're independent uh, colonies of chimps. They don't mingle very much. You know, they make their little uh, organizations, and they don't mix with each other. They don't cross rivers, so they're very well isolated. And she was able to show uh, which were positive and which were not. And on this map, all these circles, the yellow ones were positive for SIV, and the white ones were not. And um, if you know anything about chimp uh, biology, uh, they're, they're, they're all called pan, and uh, they have different subsequent names. So they're pan troglodytes, and then there's troglodytes, schweinfurthi, then there's the paniscus, which are the bonobos. Um, 
Elioti and Virus. So these are the five different kinds of chimps that are living in this area. And only Pan troglodytes, troglodytes, which are the red ones in this area of Gabon, Congo, Cameroon, uh, and Pan troglodytes schweinfurthi, which are the blue area, the ones in the blue area there. Um, Oh, they're the only ones that harbor SIV, CPZ, and uh, the ones in this area by Cameroon was the closest in sequence to HIV. And so she's published a number of papers saying this has to be uh, the ancestor of HIV because it's so close in sequence from this particular uh, group of uh, animals here. So SIV CPZ is a virus transmitted among chimps by sexual intercourse, just like HIV among people. It's also transmitted mother to child. Also, it's believed to be also transmitted during aggression. Tri chimps can fight one another and cut each other and transmit infections that way. Uh, the transmission probability per coital act is in the range of the human probability, 0.001. It's one of the thousand, right? 10, 100,000, one of the, one of the thousand or so. And it's pathogenic. This is an interesting finding. So initially when SIV was discovered, people thought it wasn't pathogenic in chimps. And then um, Jane Goodall, you know that name? She had been following and studying chimps for many years in Africa. She had a colony that she was following. Uh, Beatrice was able to study some of her chimps and they started dying. So Beatrice recalls in her seminar, you know, she, they would call and say, this sample we have, what what chimp is that from? Can you get more? And she would say, no, nah, that chimp has died. And they realized over the years that the SIV was actually killing uh, the chimps as well. So it's pathogenic, which suggests a recent introduction into chimps and not a virus that's been evolving with chimps for many years. So the results of this and many other studies are summarized here. Uh, this is the origin of HIV-1 and HIV-2, which we'll talk about in a moment. So it turns out that uh, Monkeys, not, not chimps or gorillas, but monkeys uh, in Africa, and those are these lovely animals here, sooty mangabees, sykes, mantled, gareza, vervets, lusts, mandrill, etc. All these monkeys are infected. These are old world monkeys. They've been infected for millions of years with their own kinds of SIV. And, their own, and the viruses have been isolated from each of these species and they're given the name of the species, SIV Mona, for example, SIV red cap Mangabe, they're all slightly different. They've all evolved with these monkeys for years. And the monkeys are, for the most part, healthy. So they have evolved with the virus for long enough that both sides of the equation have evolved to be uh, able to, to coexist. Now, um, what has happened for HIV-1 is that the virus that infects chimps, PTT, pan troglodytes, troglodytes. Uh, that, that animal, of course, is infected with SIV CPZ. SIV CPZ is a recombinant between uh, the Mona monkey and the red cap mangabe SIV. So, somehow, and probably not too long ago, within the hundreds of thousands of years ago, a chimp acquired. Uh, this virus from two different monkeys, possibly by eating them. We know that chimps will eat meat from time to time. And that is the source of the SIV pandemic in chimps, if you will. And it's PTT, SIV, then went into people. As we'll see in a moment, there are four groups of HIV-1, and two of them, M and N, clearly came from SIV, CPZ. We'll talk a little bit about how that happened as well. Um, now, there are also two other groups, P and O, much rarer infections in humans, but HIV, P and O seem to come from an SIV that infects gorillas, interestingly. And that gorilla SIV is clearly derived from SIV CPZ. We don't know how it transmitted from chimps to gorillas. Maybe they were fighting, maybe a gorilla ate a chimp, we have no idea. But very interesting. Two monkey SIVs led to uh, SIV CPZ, which went into people, HIV MNN, and then SIV CPZ into gorillas and then into people. So we have four separate crossovers from chimps and gorillas into people. So those four groups of HIV are four separate crossovers. 
I'm saying this a few times because every year I ask this on the exam and some people don't know the answer. Four separate crossovers of HIV from animals into people. And the reason it's interesting is because you know, we have this huge pandemic, uh, of, which is mostly the, the M group, but that has also happened four separate times. So here are some phylogenetic trees that comprise some of the evidence that um, HIV came from uh, SIV. So these are phylogenetic trees of the gag, pol, and envelope proteins. So three, remember, if you get similar results for three different proteins or three different genes, you have confidence of the, your uh, findings. So here we see HIV-M. That's the main group of HIV. It's caused most of the infections globally. You can see that is clustered, has the same uh, ancestor as SIV-CPT, PTT. There you go, just three different, different isolates here. And then we have HIVN, which clusters with uh, CPZ, PTT. Okay, so M and N clearly SIV, CPZ origins. And then we have HIVP here, clustering with SIV, GOR, gorilla, and HIVO, clustering with SIV, gorilla as well. And the same conclusion you can get from looking at each of these other proteins as well. So uh, that is what we think is the origin of these viruses from four different crossovers, two from uh, chimpanzees and two from gorillas. All right, so now you're probably wondering, how did the virus get from a chimp and a gorilla into people? Of course, we don't know, but uh, a hypothesis is called the cut hunter hypothesis, and that is that in these parts of the country, as we know from current Ebola outbreaks, people hunt bush meat. You can't just go to a supermarket and buy your meat, because there aren't any. You have to hunt it, and people will hunt and catch and eat whatever they can find, and that could be bats or chimpanzees. Gorillas, impossible to find. You might find a carcass, but even that is hard to find as well. Uh, but obviously, it must have happened at some point. The idea is that at some point in history, a hunter, a man or a woman, we don't know what it was, uh, caught a chimpanzee was dressing it in the field, cutting the meat off from the bone, and lots of blood is flowing from the chimp. The chimp is infected with SIV. The hunter cuts him or herself and is inoculated uh, with SIV. And in the book that I showed you at the beginning, The Origin of AIDS, he does some calculations in one of the chapters, which suggests that in 1921, there were probably less than 10 people who had gotten infected uh, from doing this, from acquiring SIV CPZ, but only one probably spread and multiply. You could, you could look at the phylogenetics of, of all the viruses that are around today, and they probably had just one origin. This is amazing. The whole outbreak we have today started with one chimp being hunted uh, by one hunter. And the, the in, other interesting part is that these have probably happened lots of times over the years, because uh, you know every uh, chimp in certain areas are in, is infected with SIV, and they're always being hunted. And so probably there are lots of crossovers, but only one really hit it big time and spread globally. And that's an interesting question. Why this one? And of course, the corollary is, is, is it going to happen again? And I would say absolutely, it could happen again. We have to be very vigilant to make sure we don't have another crossover. Of course, we can respond a lot quicker now, but we do have to look for this. So as I said, there are four separate crossover events from uh, primates into humans, M and O, probably happened sometime in the first three decades of the 20th century. I say about 1920, 21, just the average of that time. And in P more recently, but there's not enough isolates to really pin it down exactly. And quite clearly, the epicenter of all the spread and diversification of these viruses was Kinshasa. Uh, and the spread of infection seemed to parallel the development of colonial cities in these countries. So uh, at the upper left is a map or a graph showing you population growth on the y-axis with year on the x-axis. And the, um, the M group origin is shown here, shaded, time to most recent common ancestor, that's TMRCA, sometime in these years from about 1880 to 1925 or so. 
Um, and you can see these various cities in the Central African region here uh, and their population growth. So, you know, they're, they were not big cities in this area in the 1800s. There were mostly tr small tribes run by tribal leaders that were isolated, um, but they began to grow largely because of colonization by European countries who went in and said, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine, I'm gonna take this. And they built cities and the cities grew. They, uh, these cities, and, and Leopoldville was the biggest and most dynamic, um, it attracted migrants from the countryside, come work in the city and uh, get out of the countryside. They leave their family behind, they go to the city and work there. The population's growing incredibly, as you can see here. And probably at some point the cut hunter, the cut hunter went into one of these cities and maybe went to live there, visited a brothel, then an STD clinic. And of course, as these cities grow and lots of male workers are brought in, they have to have STD clinics, they have to have brothels, and this is how the infection is spread. And um, some of the women in these brothels had up to a thousand clients a year, so you can see very easy to spread infections. The STD clinics, uh, these men would visit them and they would get treatments for other things using not properly sterilized syringes. So a confluence of events which we would call a perfect storm, right? A cut hunter, growth in the population of cities, colonization by European countries who think they're doing good but they're not really, uh, and that all adds to it. <clears throat> now the um, Belgian Congo was, is an interesting story, of course, that was the Congo taken over by Belgium and they brought in their own physicians to make the workers healthy and uh, in the early 60s, of course, there was a revolution and the country said, get out, we don't want you here anymore. So um, they went back to Belgium, but then the country had no physicians, so they reached out to Haiti because in, in Haiti they spoke French, the same language and many Haitian physicians came and lived in the Congo for many years and then went back to Haiti. And that's how we think the virus went from uh, Africa to Haiti. And of course, from Haiti it then went to the US and many other parts of the world. So all the, the history of this region is all bound up in the origin of AIDS. And that's all told very nicely in that book. So the spread is due to European colonization, establishment of population centers, as I've said, uh, the introduction of health care, but using uh, unsterilized needles. And, you know, uh, Jacques Pepin in his book says there were probably lots of cases of people who were sick with immunodeficiency from the 20s, 30s, 40s, but no one ever recognized it. It was uh, it's just an illness, you know, they're nonspecific symptoms and no one ever figured it out. And of course, I told you the story of Egypt at the turn of the 20th century, treating much of the population for schistosomiasis, spread HCV to millions of people because they didn't use sterile, sterilized needles. So this all probably resulted in the large scale uh, amplification of the virus. If it were to emerge again today, it would probably similarly be amplified because there's the same conditions are, are still at play there, but hopefully we would recognize it more quickly. Now just uh, last year, a really interesting paper was published in Nature uh, by Michael Warby and his group. Here's the link to it. And what they were able to do was to obtain a number of archived serum samples from cohorts of men who have sex with men in New York and San Francisco. And these were collected by their physicians years ago and frozen. And typically, you know, these are from the 70s, throughout the 70s, and typically the RNA is all degraded in these samples, but they developed a way to amplify the RNA enough so that they could get sequence, which was really good. And it made clear uh, from this analysis that uh, the virus uh, clearly went from Central Africa to Haiti in about 1969 or so. Uh, and then uh, by, the, by a few years later, 71 made its way uh, to New York. Uh, from there, it spread to New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Georgia. And, that, and these are all from analyzing cohorts of men who lived in these areas and did some traveling. And then they could also see it clearly spread from uh, New York to California. And if you look at the phylogenetic tree here, this is based on all the sequences they obtained from these archived samples in the 70s. You can see there's a single ancestor uh, related to a Haitian strain. And then everything from New York City and San Francisco 
uh, is all downstream of that ancestor. Okay, you can see the earlier samples from New York City here and eventually, now these are dated earlier from San Francisco because that's when they were obtained, but they are definitely downstream uh, of the New York uh, samples indicating that they originated in New York. So this puts, this sheds some more light on the early uh, emergence and spreading of HIV. What's really interesting, if you know anything about the story, you've probably heard of patient zero and his, his virus is, is right in here. Uh, patient zero was Gaetan Dugas, who was a flight attendant who traveled a lot and everyone blamed him for bringing HIV to the US. Um, he had lots of sex partners and he documented them. He had a book and he kept all their names in it and in fact, they could sort out a lot of the transmission because of that. And because of that, uh, they thought he would be at, at the epicenter of the outbreak, but in fact he's not. He's just another line on this graph. He's downstream of many other people. So he was promiscuous, but he didn't bring the virus to the U.S. and um, you know, he was just another line uh, in this phylogenetic tree. So if, this is important because you know, the press today still will blame him for, for spreading AIDS to this country, but he didn't. Of course, he's, he's long dead, but perhaps his family gets some comfort from that. Uh, HIV-2 is the other virus that uh, causes an AIDS-like disease. This was first isolated in Guinea-Bissau up here, Western African coast. It has 30 to 40 percent identity with HIV-1, clearly an HIV, but a very different virus. Primarily restricted to Western African populations. It's much less virulent than HIV-1. Uh, most infected people don't get AIDS. Uh, it's less transmissible and there's no mother to infant spread as there is for HIV-1. This uh, is uh, a product of a crossover from the sooty mangabe. You can go back to that slide with the uh, monkeys on it. Here's a sooty mangabe here. It's got its own uh, virus called SIV sooty mangabe and uh, that went into people as uh, HIV-2. It's also inadvertently introduced into macaques in colonies in the U.S who are studying various um, biological issues. And um, these, these animals were thought to be naturally infected, but actually were not. Now there have been eight separate crossovers of uh, HIV, SIV, sooty, mangabe, MAC into humans. And each arose from, so there are eight distinct lineages and they each arose from a separate infection, just like there are four HIVs, four separate crossovers from monkeys to people. Uh, HIV-2, eight separate crossovers. Why is that? People tend to keep these sooty mangabees as pets. Of course, they're captured, they're not bred, so they're infected and so probably much easier to, to infect people that way. People typically don't keep chimpanzees for pets and so that probably restricts the uh, crossover. So uh, HIV is, is uh, classified into four groups, as I've told you. Uh, group M, N, O, and P. They're shown here on this phylogenetic tree. HIV-1 and HIV-2 would be a separate tree. Uh, group M, M stands for Maine. 99% of all infections fall within HIV-1. M, uh, group O is outlier because there are not a lot of infections, less than 1% limited to Cameroon, Gabon, and neighboring countries. And group N, there have only been 13 cases, all in Cameroon so far. Group P, two cases. Uh, in Cameroon, each from an independent transmission of SIV to humans. All right, so there you go, M, N, O, and P. As you can see on that graph, uh, M has further diversified into nine subtypes. So M is in so many people, in so many diverse locations, it gets into a new population with slightly different environment, it diversifies differently, so you're getting all these different subtypes. Nine subtypes, and high risk individuals tend to be multiply infected. Brothel workers get infected over and over with many different uh, types, so uh, subtypes. And so what happens is they can then generate recombinants. They're called circulating recombinant forms. And if they're fit, they will then take off and spread. So if a recombinant is generated in a prostitute, she can spread it to someone else. And then if it's fit, it will take off and spread. So there are 48 such recombinants so far of subtypes. Now, you may ask, is there any difference in uh, the disease caused by 
these different subtypes. There doesn't seem to be. They seem to be products of evolution in specific populations. There are some differences. So, uh, people infected with D seem to die faster. Uh, shedding of subtype C in the, in the female genital tract is higher and that may cause more transmission to men and extensive spread in Africa. So, C has, ex has spread extensively in Africa, but we're not really sure about this. Um, and whether those differences are due to the subtype. Now, the, the useful uh, information you can get from looking at subtypes is that if a subtype is introduced into a population, then everything that diversifies after that can be seen clearly to derive from the original subtype. That's what I mean here when I say HIV evolves in one direction to numerous subtypes and recombinants. So, you could re reconstruct the, the sequence uh, of infections in a country or a region just by looking at the local distribution of subtypes. And of course, the reason we can do this, it seems obvious now, but in the 90s, new tools were developed, uh, sequencing and PCR, so that we could look at lots and lots of samples in an efficient manner, generate the sequence, and compare them. And when you do this, there's more diversity in Central Africa than anywhere else in the world in terms of subtypes. So, clearly, the virus began there, had lots of time to diversify, and then a subtype would go somewhere else and start a new lineage there, but nowhere has the same amount of diversity as Central Africa. So, again, because the virus originated by the cross-species jump there, it had time, has had a lot of time to diversify, and we see a lot in Africa. Now, this ability to track uh, subtypes has also been used forensically. There have been a number of trials where men have been on trial for infecting many women with HIV, okay? This really uh, crazy behavior where they don't tell the women they're infected, they transmit it and then they get infected. So, there have been a few and they have mostly been solved by sequencing. They could actually prove in trials that he infected these women based on the virus in him and the virus that they find in each of the women. So, when you infect someone, it's usually one virus that takes hold in the person you're transmitting to and if you find that virus in the original person, remember you have a quasi-species replicating in the infected person. If you can find a member of that quasi-species in the other person that, that proves that uh, they were infected by him. Um, now, another interesting bit of information about the subtypes, uh, some are associated in, in specific location with modes of transmission and that's because of the, the, what we call the founder effect. If a virus is introduced into a specific at-risk group, that virus will spread among those individuals and you'll see only that subtype. So, for example, subtype B is found in 96 percent of white homosexuals in South Africa. So, it was imported from the U.S., someone brought it over into that community and it is now proliferated in that community and you can see its preponderance. Also, subtype C, 81 percent of infections in black heterosexuals. So, that's the founder effect. Here's a map of uh, the world showing you the distribution of subtypes by part pie charts in different colors. So, here are all the subtypes uh, A through K in different colors and then some circulating recombinant forms at the bottom and you can see subtype C accounts for 50 percent of infections, uh, a little less for B and A than G, a couple of recombinant circulating forms as well and then F, H, J and K are pretty limited in transmission. So, you can see the blue is, is subtype C. Um, there is a lot of that in Africa, on the, in the African continent shown here. Central Africa has expanded. Look at all the diversity, all the different subtypes. Again, it's been there a very long time and it's had a lot of chance to diversify. Uh, in the U.S. here, we have mostly B, you can see by the pie chart. Uh, and globally, 48 percent C, 11 percent uh, B and 12 percent A. So, again, these represent seedings from its original origins in Africa of a specific subtype into a different region and that subtype takes hold and tends to predominate. <clears throat> now, this virus is not particularly infectious. It's not anywhere as contagious as measles. It has an R naught, R, R naught of 2 to 5. So, that means an infected person on average can infect 2 to 5 other people. It's not spread by respiratory, alimentary or vector roots. It is spread mainly by the roots shown here at the bottom and it differs according to the country. 
uh, in the US, 62% of transmission is among men having sex with men. In Eastern Europe and Central Asia, uh, injecting drug users is the main route of transmission. And MSM is only 4%. Latin America, um, uh, the main route of transmission is others. It's, it's a mixture of others. Where, and the, the highest here is 26% men having sex with men. South and Southeast Asia, commercial sex workers and their clients, 48%. So you can see a variety of different uh, routes of spread. Mother to child at birth, about 5% of the cases are spread by that route. Again, a mother is infected, shedding virus and blood during birth, and the child is infected at that point. It's not transplacental infection. It's by blood present at birth getting into the child. You can find the virus in a number of uh, body fluids. I've got red arrows by the ones that are particularly high and are probably important for spread or pathogenesis, cerebrospinal fluid, plasma, blood plasma, of course, semen. Uh, this is all uh, free virus. We think also that the virus is spread uh, in infected cells as well. You can find it in PBMCs uh, and uh, also in cells within uh, the semen. Here's an interesting graph showing you uh, the probability of transmission. This was a study done uh, in Uganda and this was a study of monogamous, heterosexual, HIV discordant couples. All right, so uh, these were, one of the couple had HIV, the other did not, and they supposedly did not um, have sex with anyone else, which is obviously not true because if one of them had HIV, they had to, but that's what they told the interviewers. And then they asked them, they looked at the, uh, the level in the blood of uh, RNA, the viral load, RNA copies per mil, and you can see there are four different levels, low, intermediate, and very high levels, and they looked at the probability of transmission. So in other words, uh, the transmission from the infected person in the, in the couple to the uninfected person, obviously. So you follow them for a while and you check them periodically. And you can see the risk of transmission goes up with um, viral load. But even more importantly, if one of the partners has genital ulcer disease resulting in lesions, uh, the risk in red goes, uh, is even higher as well. And this is not just because there are open wounds that allow virus to penetrate, but it turns out that there are, uh, if these are, say, herpes virus caused, there are cytokines produced that actually enhance HIV infection of cells. So the risk here is about 0.001, one per thousand. Uh, so it's, it's one, the risk of one in, in about a thousand coital acts. So it, it seems low, but remember, it doesn't mean it's after a thousand. It could be anywhere from one to a thousand. So you just don't know when that's, that risk is going to uh, occur. And these are the numbers uh, that have been obtained over uh, a number of other studies. So risk of transmission. Here we have sexual transmission, female to male. And that's the range from 1 to 700 to 1 in 3,000, male to female. And male to male is the highest. And we have parenteral by transfusion of infected blood, very high. Of course, you're putting virus right into people. Needle sharing, uh, a needle stick, an accidental needle stick, say, in a hospital setting. Uh, but if you do have a needle stick, a health worker sticks themselves with a needle that's from a patient with HIV. If you treat them with AZT, you can reduce the risk of infection. So that's post-exposure prophylaxis. And then mother to infant is very high without AZT 1 and 4. And you can reduce it just before birth by giving the mother a dose of AZT. You don't want to treat her throughout in, uh, her pregnancy because that's not good for the child. Remember, AZT uh, indiscriminately inhibits DNA synthesis. Uh, so just before birth, you give a dose of AZT to reduce viral loads, and that substantially releases transmission uh, to the young. And of course, you have to know the mother is infected, right? And so that depends on a healthcare system, which is fine here in the U.S., but in many other parts of the world, we don't have it yet, and that, that needs to be done. Uh, the, it's very easy to interrupt transmission. It's reduced by air drying, heating, bleach, alcohol. 70% alcohol works well to inactivate it, uh, extremes of pH, and of course, uh, sexual transmission or intravenous drug use bypasses all of these limitations because you're putting the virus right into the person. And that's how this virus has been selected for over the years. 
from our discussion many weeks ago on receptors, you, you know that this virus uh, binds CD4 receptor on the surface of CD4 target cells, CD4 positive target cells. It also requires a second receptor, which is a chemokine receptor of one of two kinds, CXCR4, which is an alpha chemokine receptor, or uh, CCR5, the beta chemokine receptor. And we talked about why both of these receptors are needed for high affinity binding uh, and infection. So in primary HIV infection, virus is introduced either directly into the blood or via mucosal surfaces. Uh, it interacts initially with dendritic cells, right, which are always probing for foreign antigens. But in this case, uh, the virus binds to the dendritic cell by a, pro a protein called DC sign there. It doesn't enter these cells, but then what do the dendritic cells do? They go in the lymph node and they bring the virus there and deliver it to their target cells, CD4 positive lymphocytes. Uh, and there the virus replicates extensively, gets back out into the blood and, and can spread elsewhere. Um, so there's very high vir viremia and dissemination uh, uh, initially. Uh, eventually the immune response kicks in and reduces the virus to a certain level uh, after about six months or so. Uh, in terms of clinical characteristics, 50 to 90 percent are symptomatic, so higher than a lot of the viruses we've talked about. Five, five to 30 day uh, incubation period, uh, and the symptoms and signs include these listed here, some, many of which of course are flu-like and you couldn't tell there was anything different. Some of them uh, might be uh, considered uh, pathognomonic to HIV, lymphadenopathy, weight loss, uh, mucocutaneous ulcerations. Uh, and then uh, this lasts for about 14 days. So the initial infection, about a 14-day period of illness, which then goes away. Now the virus, of course, is spreading throughout uh, the body via the blood, and wherever there is lymphoid tissue, it will infect and destroy it. So this is a picture of the, of the uh, terminal ileum, done with a camera, obviously, snaked into there. Now normally, this is what your terminal ileum looks like. Uh, this is from an HIV negative individual. It's full of gut associated lymphoid tissue, pyres patches, collections of lymphoid tissues that are important for uh, sensing foreign antigens in the gut. And in an HIV infected person, all those cells are gone, they're destroyed. I mean, this looks like a lovely intestine, but it shouldn't be that way. It should have lots of gut associated lymphoid tissue and it's gone because the virus has destroyed it. So here's the, the overall course of infection. You have infection here at time zero, there's a brief uh, a 14 day period of disease, you have a peak of viremia. So the bottom panel is HIV RNA. Um, the viremia is controlled and reaches a set point level. It's not zero, but it reaches a certain level which can vary depending on the patient for many, many, many years. During this time, uh, there's the acute phase which, in which there are those symptoms that I showed you. And then a period, an, an asymptomatic phase uh, during which uh, the, the number of T cells slowly decline as the virus is killing them. Uh, the CD8 cells remain relatively constant. And then after a long period of time, the T cells reach a level that no longer can sustain immune responses. The virus replicates out of control. Uh, T cells also decline as well. And there you have development of AIDS uh, in terms of other infections that we can't fight off and which eventually kill the patient. I think we did talk about the CCR5 delta 32 mutation, which is a host gene that determines susceptibility to infection. This is a deletion in the gene encoding the co-receptor CCR5, present in 4 to 16 percent of people of European descent. These individuals are resistant to infection. So it turns out that it's CCR5 binding viruses that are transmitted from one person to another, even though late in AIDS or, or during uh, the, the part of age when there's lots of virus, the, it's actually CXCR4 viruses that predominate. The ones that are transmitted are the minority, the CCR5. So these individuals are resistant to infection. As I told you, the, the German AIDS patient famously review, re received a uh, stem cell transplant from a patient with a deletion of CCR5 delta 32, and he was cured. However, this hasn't worked for anybody else since then. And uh, nevertheless, people are trying to disrupt CCR5 uh, with a variety of approaches, most recently CRISPR-Cas, as a way to cure people uh, with, uh, with the infection. Uh, in someone with established infection, you have active replication throughout disease. It's, the virus is replicating every day. There are major reservoirs of infection. 
not only in the blood, but in the various lymph tissues in the gut, as I showed you, the CNS, the genital tract. You make a ton of virus every day with an incredible half-life, up to 30 minutes half of the virus particles are turning over. So you're making lots of virus, clearly lots of opportunity uh, for evolution, and we do see that. There are many different uh, compartments in which the virus replicates. The blood compartment is shown here on the left, and underneath the various kinds of cells is the half-life of those cells. So you can see the CD4 lymphocytes in the blood are infected, they're producing a lot of virus. They have a half-life of about a day or so. The virus released, of course, can infect new CD4 cells. They're continuously produced from the bone marrow. They come out into the blood, and then they're infected right away. Um, now, when, when, when CD4 cells sense or presented an antigen, they become activated right, and start to produce cytokines. And that's just what HIV prefers to replicate in an activated CD4 cell. So it's a, it's a cycle that keeps on accelerating. The virus replicates and activates CD4 cells, and they become a better host for replication. There are also uh, other compartments where the virus can infect CD4-positive lymphocytes, um, uh, you know, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. There's some with very, very long half-life. So this is a cell whose half-life is 145 days, and so obviously this can have virus persistence for a long time. Um, there are memory cells as well that can be infected, but not shown on these slides are the hematopoietic progenitor cells, which inhabit your bone marrow, uh, and they give rise to all of these cells, and they can be latently infected with no virus production, so they remain in your bone marrow probably for your lifetime, and as I said earlier, getting rid of those is the key. So we looked at the typical progressor of uh, AIDS on the left, where you have that initial primary infection followed by years of clinical latency and then AIDS at the end. There are also other kinds of clinical presentations or the rapid progressors where all of this is accelerated and uh, the years, uh, it's one or two years perhaps. And then there are non-progressors, individuals who are initially infected and then live in their entire lives without having, without developing AIDS. So we're very interested in them, of course. We'd like to know what's different about them. So they've gotten a lot of study. They're called elite controllers. They have normal CD4 counts and very, very low viral loads. They used to think no virus, but then we got better at doing PCR, and we can see 1 to 30 copies per mil for many, many years in the absence of antiretroviral uh, therapy. Magic Johnson is an elite controller, for example. He's lived many years, although he's having retroviral therapy as well. One in 300 infected people seem to control infection this way. And one of the th properties it's associated with is particular MHC genes, all right, and especially B57 and B27, um, that uh, enable very good T cell responses to gag proteins of the virus. So these are not people who are generating attenuated viruses during infection, but rather it's because they have a particular MHC gene that's very good at recognizing viral peptides, uh, presenting viral peptides to CD8 cells. So that's shown here. Remember, uh, an infected cell will be recognized by a CTL, uh, by a viral peptide that's displayed in the MHC molecule. So the viral peptide is orange, the MHC is blue, and the CTL will recognize it. So these MHCs are encoded by polymorphic genes in us. They vary in different populations. And elite controllers have a certain kind of MHC that seems to be very good at recognizing uh, HIV peptides. Now, in the course of these years of infection, the peptides that are presented here vary. They, they undergo selection and mutation, and many MHCs can no longer present them. They don't bind to the MHC anymore. But for some reason, the elite controllers have an MHC that will bind to HIV peptides of any sequence that are generated. They're very good at recognizing them. Um, there, is, there is a reason for that we don't have time to go into, but it probably happens uh, at birth when, you know, as, as we're developing our immune system, we get rid of a lot of the self-reactive peptides. And these individuals may keep more self-reactive peptides and, as a consequence, have a more mm, uh, an MHC that's more able to recognize a variety of peptides. Some of the targets 
uh, of HIV leading to immune dysfunction. Of course, the CD4 T cells are infected and destroyed, and that affects all of the cytokine helper uh, properties of these. Uh, CD8 cells also decrease. B cells, they produce bad antibodies. They make uh, pat bad responses to antigens. They make autoantibodies. Other cells, monocytes, are, are also uh, killed. The, the total number decreases. Dendritic cells uh, and uh, the cytotoxic function of NK cells decrease. You couldn't really wreck the immune system any more than this. You're just affecting almost every level of the immune system uh, by this infection. And then at the end of these years of incubation, uh, AIDS is defined here, less than 200 CD4 T cells per mil, uh, and the presence of many opportunistic infections, including protozoal, you can see here, uh, pneumocystis, the first one that brought this disease to our attention, but many others as well, bacterial infections, mycobacterium, uh, a big problem these days, fungal infections, viral infections as well, and as I said, um, activated T cells are, gr are great substrates for HIV because activation is what the T cells do when they see a foreign antigen, but that happens to be perfect for HIV replication. We also see lots of malignancies associated with infection and a variety of neurological symptoms of all sorts called the AIDS dementia complex. So it, to summarize all of this, we have our acute phase of infection where reservoirs are established, then we have an asymptomatic phase where the patient may be well or they may have some sporadic symptoms as are shown here, fatigue, weight loss, et cetera, continuous virus production, virus evolution, so much turnover, and then the symptomatic phase um, in, in two different, divided into two uh, types depending on how many CD4 positive T cells are present. Uh, fewer than 200, of course, full-blown AIDS with the opportunistic inf uh, infections. And of course, those are the cancers that are what kill the patient eventually. In the CNS, the virus is able to enter from capillaries. So here is a, as a capillary in the CNS. It can enter uh, through astrocytes or through infected monocytes. Uh, within the CNS, the monocytes uh, lyse and release cytokines and viral proteins and those are thought to be neurotoxic. So the virus is not directly infecting neurons, but the products uh, of, of released by infected macrophages, both viral and, and cytokines from the cell, cause neurotoxicity, and we believe this leads to the neurological symptoms. And on the right is a picture of a, a macrophage and all the things that it can release uh, upon infection and lysis with HIV, including uh, a variety of cytokines, nitric oxide, which you know uh, is toxic, uh, arachidonic acid, metabolites, other toxic factors. So this possibly explains uh, the CNS toxicity. There's an increase in cancer uh, during HIV infected. 40% of infected individuals show some cancer or another, which is a result of dysregulation of the immune system. First of all, there's no proper immune surveillance, so normally an immunocompetent person will show, uh, will be able to survey cancer cells and get rid of them, but that's gone in these individuals. And the cytokines that are produced leads, lead to inappropriate proliferation. Cells keep replicating. Remember, when cytokines are produced, they keep dividing, and that's a recipe for oncogenesis, and as well, a lot of uh, oncogenic viruses replicate really well in these cells and can lead to a variety uh, of tumors. Kaposi's sarcoma was, of course, one of the first malignancies to be associated with AIDS. This was described a long time ago uh, and is present before the AIDS, mainly in older Mediterranean men. It occurs in about 20% of people. And this requires infection with, this, with another virus, human herpes virus 8, plus HIV are needed for the development of this. This is a, a sarcoma which is not only present on the skin, that's, you can easily see it of course, but many internal organs will also develop tumors as well, and so it can be lethal. So can we make a vaccine? During infection, you know, we have lots of virus, but eventually the virus is controlled early on. We have antiviral immunity, but why does virus persist? Uh, we know there is some effective immunity because super infection occurs less, inf less frequently than initial infection people have not been able to understand uh, why the immune response is controlling infection. And a main problem, of course, is evolution. 
during these long-term infections. You have the initial virus infecting. By the time antibodies to that virus arise, you have antigenic variation shown by the change from purple to orange. And then as the body responds to the orange virus, uh, then it changes again to blue. So you have this continual mutation. It happens also at the level of T cell epitopes. Many, many vaccine trials have been done, and I'll just tell you about one of them, which was a famous one called RV144. It was a dual regimen. First, uh, these individuals got uh, a three viral proteins in a canary pox vector, uh, and then they got a recombinant GP120 protein. 16,000 volunteers in Thailand, they got six prime and six boost injections, and the, the rate of infection was lowered only 31% compared with placebo. This is just at the border of being a placebo effect. And in fact, look at the numbers, 16,000 people. Uh, the um, unimmunized group, they had 74 cases of AIDS and the immunized group had 51. And to this day, people can't understand why this worked if it did at all. The numbers are very small. So this isn't the solution. People have identified broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, in a number of individuals. This is a model of the glycoprotein of the virus. And these are a variety of antibodies uh, that bind, shown in colors here, that bind to parts of this glycoprotein that can neutralize many different subtypes, which is good, and they recognize conserved epitopes. And so um, these have been incorporated into vectors. We'll talk about this in our last lecture, but I just want to mention the gene for these broadly neutralizing antibodies have been introduced to an adeno-associated virus vector and they're, they're used to inoculate humanized mice. These are mice that have a human immune system, so they can be infected with HIV. Otherwise, you can't infect the mice. And if these mice are making antibodies, these, one of these broadly neutralizing antibodies, they will be protected against infection. So in this graph, all the black lines are uh, control mice. All the red lines are mice that are making antibodies, and they do not produce HIV. So this is just going into a human clinical trial to see if we can give people antibodies. The cool thing about these AAV vectors, which we'll talk about later, is they persist for years and years, so you'll be continually making antibodies. And another cool approach is to use cytomegalovirus vectors. So this is an experiment in rhesus macaques using a rhesus cytomegalovirus, and they're infecting these animals with SIV, but this is a proof of concept. So Cytomegalovirus is cool because it sets up a persistent infection for the life of the animal. So you can make derivatives of the virus that are not pathogenic and express viral proteins in them. Bottom line here, this is an experiment of a number of different uh, animals. And the blue ones got the control without the viral peptides in the CMV. And upon challenge, they all develop high plasma viral loads. And all of these other monkeys received CMV vector uh, the viral proteins. And you can see many of those have no viral loads whatsoever. There are a few that produce virus here and there, as you can see. So obviously this needs a bit more work, but this is something that will go uh, into animals as well. So the traditional vaccine approach hasn't worked. So we're trying alternative approaches based on uh, vectoring. And let me end with this thought. So in 1929, a virus went from a chimp to patient zero. And since then, we've had 78 million infections, 39 million deaths. One monkey did all this. It's just, it is amazing that this developed for so many years insidiously. And it wasn't until 1980 that we detected it. <laughs>